Okay, so this is called a difference quotient. Right here, difference quotient. I call it DQ. And it says right here, after setting up this difference quotient, simplify. So the hardest part on this is simplifying. But one of the reasons people didn't get it right was because they didn't set it up right either. So you have to understand what the symbols mean here. What does this mean? F of x plus h. What does that mean? Yeah, Andrew? You put x plus h where the x's are. Right. Okay, so basically this is going to be one big fat fraction with an h on the bottom. We already know what's going to go here, 5x plus 4 over x. Okay, there's your f of x. But it's the x, the f of x plus h part that people got wrong. So f of x plus h literally looks like this. 5 times x plus h, right, plus 4 over x plus h. So it looks like f of x, but it doesn't have x per se, and it has x plus h in it. Okay, so if you got this far, you're off to a good start, and then it matter, it's a matter of cleaning it all up. Okay? All right, so where to from here? Let me make this all blue, because I was going to change colors for some other reasons. Uh, now I need to basically find a common denominator. So I did notice that... This first part is 5x plus 5h. So 5x plus 5h plus 4 over x plus h. And if I distribute this negative here, I get minus 5x minus 4 over x. So maybe it might help to kind of write it like that first. And you'll notice the 5x actually cancels out. So that's a little bit less hassle to work with in the end. And we got rid of something. Okay. Now let's go on and uh, try to get a common denominator sort of thing. So here's where we are, but it doesn't really look like any of the answer choices yet. All right, so what I do, I need a, uh, like a common denominator. So one way to do this is just to use the idea that you learned last year with complex fractions. You can see that there are little fractions in this big fraction, right? So there's a 5h over 1, there's a 4 over x plus h, there's a 4 over x, and there's this h here. What you could do is look at all the little denominators that you've got and find an LCM. So we have a little h, a little 1 there, maybe. there's an x plus h, and there's an x there. It looks like our common multiple here is x times x plus h. So you can just multiply top and bottom by that. So that's what I'm going to do, multiply top and bottom by x and x plus h simultaneously, like that. OK, so if you multiply the red x, x plus h times this term, you're going to get 5h times x times x plus h. If you multiply by the second term, you're going to get Notice the x plus h is going to cancel here. You're multiplying 4 over x plus h times x and x plus h. So the x plus h will vanish, leaving you with just a 4x right there for the middle term. 4x minus, and then we've got this term here. I'm multiplying the triangle by the red. So I'm multiplying 4 over x by x and x plus h. That gives me what? x cancels. 4 times x plus h, right? Which is in parentheses. So it's just 4 times x plus h. And then all of this is over hx x plus h. So it's still ugly, but it's cleaning up. And all you have to do is basically distribute a little bit, and you'll see that there's a like a 5hx squared and there's a 5h squared x. All right, so let's write it all out, I guess. So it's going to look like this in black. It's going to be 5hx squared plus 5h squared x plus 4x minus 4x minus 4h all over. And then we have our denominator.
h x x plus h. Okay, so something interesting happens here. Anything that has no h goes away. So notice this 4x cancels out. And all that survives on top is just garbage with h in it. Anything that doesn't have an h is now gone, which means I can factor out an h from that top. So let's pull the h out. So this is going to be h times, and then we have 5x squared plus 5hx minus 4. And this is all over hx x plus h. And since we pulled an h out of the top, it can cancel with the h that's in the bottom, making 1. So the answer is 5x squared plus 5hx minus 4 over x times x plus h. Answer choice A. So these are just a pain to do. Difference quotients are very hard to work on, especially with certain types of functions. And this is one of those functions. Okay. Okay, I do make two promises to you. If you're careful with your algebra, I promise you, promise you that anything that has no h will cancel. I promise you that you'll build a factor out of h. I promise you that the h will cancel. And it happens on all problems. Okay? So you should get it down to where the answer has no h in the bottom. See how none of these have a factor of h? They have an x plus h, but they don't have an h factor. And up top, there might be like one or two h's left over, but if one of them has it reduced out. Okay. It takes some practice to do this, but you can easily make up your own problem. Okay? Just make up your own. You can even just do like... Mm, I wonder what the difference quotient for 2x minus 1 over 1 minus x would be. You know what I mean? And you can just play around with it and see if you could get your difference quotient. And then bring it to me. I'll tell you if you did it right. Let's go to the second problem. Determine if this is odd, even, or neither. So what some of you did was you said, ooh, an absolute value graph. V-shape. Right? And then you said, oh, okay, look. There's a 4 there. That means vertical stretch. So then you went like this. And you said, ooh, up two, shift up two. So you shifted it up two. So you went like this, basically. You just, look, I'll, I know what this looks like. It's up two spaces, and it's like a steepened, if that's a verb. Yeah, steep, <coughs> steepened. It's a steepened V graph. You're absolutely right. Get it absolutely right? It's an absolute value function. Okay. So that's a really good graph, and it certainly seems to have what kind of symmetry? <coughs> y-axis symmetry, right. And if it has y-axis symmetry, you can conclude that the function is what? Odd or even? Even. Even. But that is not a good enough justification, OK? You can't just say, oh, it looks like it has y-axis symmetry, so it must be even. What if there's like a tiny little point over here that's not symmetric on the left. You know what I mean? So we don't ever trust graphs to make justifications. Okay, you never trust a graph. And you never trust a table of a graph. What you want to do is state the rule in the book. Memorize the rule in the book. What is an even function? f of negative x equals f of x. You might not even understand what it means, but at least you're quoting a fact instead of examining a picture that you drew. Okay, so that's the reason. Let me show you the work that leads to that reason. Okay, what does f of negative x mean? What does f of negative x mean? What are you supposed to do when you see f of something? Plug it in, right? So what is f of negative x? What does it mean? It means to take your x's that are in the problem and change them to what? Negative, negative x's. But wait a minute, there's an absolute value on this negative x. So how does that simplify? What's the absolute value of negative x? It's not x. It's not x. Okay. What if x was negative? Then th this can't be right. Look, look. You can't say that the absolute value of negative x is x. What if x is a negative number? Like negative 5. You just gave me a negative output. You need 
the bars on here. Because for certain numbers, like if x is negative 5, it wouldn't make sense to leave it off. Okay? But you can certainly destroy the negative that's inside there. So it says absolutely negative x. That's the same thing as absolutely x. And now you can see that this is identical to what we started with. So f of negative x really does reduce back to the original problem we started with. So how do you make a proof? You substitute in negative x, and if it happens to be the exact same function you started with, then that means it's even. That's the only proof I can accept. Okay? Now in this next one, you're not given a function, so now you'll have to just kind of trust the graph. Can you tell what kind of symmetry this has? Not y equals x. It, it does actually appear like there's, this is a mirror, you know? But it isn't quite right. If you reflect over that thing, you get this. Not quite right. It's not y equals x. It's what? Origin point symmetry, yeah. If you look closely at this graph, why don't you guys put your pencil right here. Okay, here's your pencil. Put your pencil right there on the paper. And then rotate your paper 180 degrees, okay, just a half turn. Like literally put your pen on like this, on your desk, just stick it on there, and then turn the paper. You'll notice that the graph looks identical before and after. So that's a great little trick. Turn the page halfway around. You can see that it's the same graph you started with. Great little trick. Okay, so we can't be too um, unscholarly when we answer this. We can't say, it is odd because I switched my paper. <laughs> okay, we've got to sound like we know what we're talking about. So we'll say, uh, it is an odd function because uh, the graph has, what did the book <coughs> say? Did the book say rotational symmetry? No. Origin, Origin symmetry. symmetry. Right. This is what I want. I want you to follow the book, to follow the notes. The graph has origin symmetry. Could you write 180 degree rotational symmetry about the origin? Yes. But most pre-calc teachers would say, that's random. Okay, why would you write that? Uh, we call it origin symmetry in this case, okay? All right, let's go to the next one. Are there any questions so far? Okay, this is a domain problem, so you guys actually are pretty comfortable with this, I think, now. Um, in fact, I could now add a plus, don't add this, but I could add a plus 10x, see? <coughs> or plus ln of x minus 2. I could have you, like, extend this function now, and you could actually answer the question. So, this first fraction has forbidden values. x cannot be plus or minus 3. This radical has forbidden values. You've got to be real careful with square roots. Cannot take the square root of what? Negative, negative number. That means we need 2x minus 6 to not be negative. How do you write that mathematically? 2x minus 6 is not negative. Yeah, it means 0 or more, technically. Right? Not negative. There you go. Solve it. So how do you solve 2x minus 6 is greater than or equal to 0? Add the 6, divide by 2, right? <coughs> okay, so we're getting mul multiple conclusions. We're saying x is definitely not 3. It's not negative 3, but it's greater than or equal to 3. See? And if you want to do the red parts, you can too. You could say x is definitely not k, uh, 2k plus 1 times pi over 2. And you can look at this and say x minus 2 has to be greater than 0, so x is greater than 2. Okay, so each one has its own little domain rule. But let's just stick with the blue right now. They, these two domain rules, it's like if you, um, let's say you're in a classroom, right? And Mr. Short was there, and Mr. Howard was there. So they're both here, okay? Whose rules do you think we would abide by? Both, right. The students would behave in accordance with both teachers, right, both people. They would try to follow any rules that they've heard Mr. Howard say, and they try to follow the rules Mr. Short said, right? Because there's like two sets of rules, and you want to make sure you obey everything. So we want to make sure that we are picking numbers greater than equal to 3, but not for AC. So that would mean what? 
numbers strictly greater than 3, right? If you allow x to be 3, then this guy's going to be unhappy, and this function, I'm sorry, uh, this function will be unhappy, and it won't work. And if you let x be exactly 3, this function's happy. But we have to have both functions happy, see? So we're going to go ahead and buy the rules of all in charge. And so we'll just go ahead and do x is greater than 3. That's the best conclusion I can come up with. We also can write this as 3 common infinity. It's the same thing. Right? Okay, and then you look at this function down here. This function's a pushover. It doesn't have any rules at all. It's a cube root, for crying out loud. Cube roots are hungry creatures. You give them any number, they'll give you an answer. It doesn't matter if you're pi or negative pi. It doesn't matter if the inside's a million or negative a million. It makes no difference. You can always get an answer for the cube root. Okay? So anyway, uh, that one is just all real numbers. Okay, some of you wrote x minus 10 is greater than or equal to 0, and you said x has to be greater than or equal to 10. What's wrong with this picture? This is incorrect. What's wrong with this picture? Yeah, whoever did this was playing the rules of a square root. Okay, square roots are picky. Cube roots are not. So it's all real numbers. Okay, let's look at average rate of change. That's just a slightly important idea for calculus. So let's go down here. Uh, find the average rate of change for the function from 2 to x. So hopefully you know what this phrase means, besides just a rock. Okay, I call it a rock, but what does it really mean? Does anyone remember what it means? It does mean delta, uh, technically delta y over delta x. Yeah, some of you know the formula, f of x... You can do it either way. You can do f of x2 minus f of x1 over x2 minus x1, or f of x1 minus f of x2 over x1 minus x2. But it's really just a change in y coordinate divided by a change in x coordinate. What is that? That's the same thing as a what? y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1? That sounds familiar. What is that? It's a slope. Right. So an average rate of change is a slope. You need to know that. Okay. Now, um, I'm not going to say that this is the exact graph of the function, but what's going on is we're going from x equals 2 out here to a random x value. Okay, so let me draw this for you. This is kind of what's going on. So we're going from x equals 2 to a random x value. And I think the curve goes like that. Okay, it doesn't really matter. We're just trying to understand. Okay, we're just trying to understand. So we're trying to find the slope between here and here. That's not hard to understand. So the, here's what you have to do. You have to make the connection that this point is the point 2 comma f of 2. So f of 2 is 4 over, looks like 4 over 1. So see, this is the point 2, 4 for sure. And this is the point, I guess I'll never know. I guess it's just the point x, comma, f of x. I don't know what it is. That's intentional. I, I don't want you to know what it is. I want you to find the slope anyway. So we're going to do y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. We don't even have to simplify. The instructions didn't tell us to simplify. OK, so here is our answer in blue. It's y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. That's the answer. That's a rock from 2 to x. So I'm going to call it a rock from 2 to x. I've got my little picture there to help me understand it. This is the answer. I'm not going to bother simplifying it. It's just the difference in y's and the difference in x's. OK, so where did I get the y's from? Where did I get this and this? How did I get four? Plugging in two. How did I get that garbage? Plugging in x. x. Right. Okay, so that, I guess that's the answer. Let's go on to part B. A oh, question? Yeah. Um, does it matter which one you make, uh, like x1 and x2? No, you could just as well have written the answer like this. 4 minus 4 over square root of x minus 1 over 2 minus x. Some of you did. You just reversed x1 and x2 around. It doesn't matter. Good question. Okay. 
But see, this next question says, use your answer for part A to find the slope from 2 to 5. Okay? So what you have to understand is what you've created, this blue formula, you know what its job is? What's this guy's job? To find slopes. So if you tell me x, so I'm going to say x. 7. If I plug in 7 into this formula, it will give me the slope of that red line. That's kind of neat. That's pretty cool. So this has a very specific job. Right? If you plug in 101, we get the slope between here and 101. OK, so I would like to find the slope from 2 to 5. And this formula was designed to find the slopes from 2 to anything you wish. So I'm going to plug in 5, and that would give me a slope from 2 to 5. OK, so I'm going to t do 4 over square root of 5 minus 1 minus 4 over 5 minus 2. So I just basically plugged in 5. And this gives me 4 over root 4 minus 4 over 3. In other words, 4 over 2 is 2. So basically you have this. It looks like the answer is negative 2 thirds. Yeah. OK, let's update our picture, OK? What have we accomplished? It's important to understand. Maybe I should have had you draw more pictures on the test. We have now found that the slope from 2 to 5, this particular secant line, the slope, is negative 2 thirds. OK? Now our job is to find the equation of that line. Because, you know, lines, they don't just have slopes. They also have equations, don't they? All right, so I want the equation of this red line that cuts through the black curve. All right? So there are lots of equations of lines. There's good old y equals mx plus b. There's y equals uh, y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. And there are actually many, many others that you haven't learned before. But which one is most convenient for our purposes? Do we know the y-intercept of the red line? No. Well, we know our two local points. That's the point 2, 4, for example. See? So this formula is the better one. In fact, you'll find that you use this a lot more often than you use y equals mx plus b. It's just for some reason, some graders teachers have decided to teach y equals mx plus b for three weeks in a row. So now you feel like you have to use it all the time. You do not use this one. It's better. You'll be glad you did. OK, so I called it the find your equation of line buddy last year. Um, we had already said that this first red point was the point 2, 4, remember? So I can just go y minus 4 equals negative 2 thirds times x minus 2. There's the point 2, 4 plugged in. So doing problem C was no harder at all. You just had to pick a form and put in a 2, 4. You could also put in a 5 of a 5 instead. OK, so that's the number 5. Any questions on that? OK. Give me one second. OK, let's go down here. Number six. And I'm going to try to display six and seven at the same time here so you can see all, all of our transformations. OK, so what does it mean, um, f of negative x? Can someone remind us? Is it a dilation, a reflection, or a translation? Reflection, right? And which axis are we reflecting over? OK, so this is a y-axis reflection. Can someone tell me why it's a y-axis ref y -axis reflection? Why is that? We run the risk of just knowing things and not understanding them. Why would changing x's to negative x's Produce this effect. Any uh, the y's are staying the same, but the x's are switching position across the y-axis, so it looks like it's reflecting. Okay, so 
5 is going to go over where negative 5 is, see? And negative 5 is going to come over here where positive 5 is. And all the x's on this side are going to jump over there. And all the x's from this side are going to jump over here. All x's trade signs. So what's going to happen is going to look like this. See? It's going to switch this way. So which direction, which axis is the mirror line? <coughs> the y-axis. So it's going to flip over this line because the right becomes the left and the left becomes the right. It's not really that hard to understand. X's are changing. So the y-axis is the mirror, the symmetry line. So this basically is what it looks like after the fact. I'm not going to try that hard, okay? I don't know, something like that. It doesn't have to be perfect. I wasn't looking for perfection, but this is part A. <coughs> so A. All right, let's go to part B. Negative f of x, negative f of x. So you can think of f of x as y. Right? This is like negative y is what it means. So if the y's are changing, what happens? Top becomes bottom and bottom becomes top, right? So the whole graph is going to flip flop this way. The y's are going to reverse. So this thing's going to look upside down. This is why whenever we have a negative out front, that's sort of our universal way of flipping it over. Okay, so just think of it as upside down. And that would look, of course, like this. So any uh, x-intercepts are going to remain x-intercepts. But that's part B. OK, next is uh, we have f of x plus 2. It looks like somebody is trying to change my x's. Look at that, x plus 2. But this time, they're not negating them. They're adding 2 to the x. So what does that do to our graph? It shifts us to the left 2. So you might say, why does it shift you to the left 2? It's a very good question. OK? I will, I will just say this briefly. You can ignore me if you don't want to hear this. But because x is typically not what's isolated, it's going to be a counterintuitive translation. So you know like when you have f. Uh, you know, y equals, and then you have like sine of x plus e to the x minus ln x. And then someone comes along and changes all your x's to x minus 2's. Or let's do x plus 2. That's what we're doing in this problem. So let's say that you go in and you just change all the x's to x plus 2's. The graph will shift to the left 2 because it's not the... It's not the x that's isolated here. Y is all by itself. So y is going to behave, like the vertical stuff is going to behave common sense. But whatever's buried in the function like this, we call the x the implicit variable because he's hiding in amongst the function. Anytime you add to, you go left to. Anytime you put in a 3x, it actually compresses it, strangely enough, and so forth. So any sort of backwards logic with the x's. Now, if you put a big fat plus 5 at the end, it really does mean up 5. So it will behave intuitively, not counter. All right. But your function is going to go left to, we said. So like this. Something like that. Close enough. And the last one is uh, f of x add 2. Think of it as y plus 2. And that literally just means add 2 to all your y's. So the graph shifts up two spaces. It looks like this. All right, actually, this part probably even goes, let me erase some of this stuff. Let me erase all of it. We're trying to go up 2, so this point's going to go up 2. This point's going to go up 2. This point's going to go up 2. So it's going to be right there, actually. This point's going to go up 2. This point's going to go up too. So it looks like this. Something like that. Okay, so sorry if that's too easy for you and I went on too long with it, but some of you are still doing it wrong. So I need, this is the final exam. I have to finally teach it one more time. And then this last problem here for translations and dilations and all that, this is your 
dilations. And this means vertical stretch. That's what the 2 means, because it's double the y. So imagine taking this y coordinate and doubling it. It'd be up here now. Imagine taking this y coordinate and doubling it. It'd be down here. So the graph is going to maintain its width, but double its height. So it's going to look like this. That's part A. And then we have part B. Does anyone know what part B is? 2x. Remember, it's counter logic. Backwards from what you might guess. Shrink. It's definitely horizontal because it's x. And it's shrink or stretch? Shrink. shrink, right. So this is a little bit hard to perform, but what happens is you're, you're doing the black graph, okay, first of all. Every x value gets divided by 2, okay? So for example, this point's not going to move because it's x is 0, and you divide by 2 and it doesn't go anywhere. This point over here is going to actually end up right there. See? Let me erase the blue. And then this point over here, if you divide that by 2, it's going to end up right here. So these three black points, A, B, C, are in their new locations, A prime, B prime, C prime. They are all halfway back to the origin. So it's kind of like the origin is a magnet, or the y-axis is a magnet, and it's pulling all the points back. And they make it back halfway exactly. So these <coughs> three represent what these whole three were. And so you don't change the heights, though. Only x is changing. So you have to kind of sketch this. Like that. Maintaining the height, but compressing the width. And the left side of this is just a reflection of it over the origin, because this is still an odd function. So you could just draw the other half like this real quick. And I'm not actually comfortable drawing any more than this, because I don't know if the black graph goes any wider. Like, I don't know what happens out here. So I'm not comfortable progressing past this point. That was sort of an ending point for this problem, so that's going to have to be my ending point. So H shrink. Those are your dilations. All right, and then the next page, or the next uh, problem here, increasing, decreasing. So in English, we read from where to where, <coughs> from left to right. And when you study a graph, you actually do the same thing. So as you go from left to right, just think of it as a roller coaster. Anytime the roller coaster is going down, then you would treat that as decreasing. Anytime it's going up, you could treat that as increasing and just go from left to right. So here I am decreasing. I just went down. Now I'm increasing. This part, well, it's just kind of constant. I didn't go up or down. Then I got to this part, and I'm on the rise again. So that's increasing. And then now I'm coming down, and that's an arrowhead, so it actually goes on down forever. Okay, so after you label it like this, you can go in and just answer the questions. Where is it increasing? It looks like between negative 3 and negative 1, it was falling, or rising, I mean. And also, it looks like between 3 and 5. And of course, you can use your interval notation if you wish. So you can write negative 3, negative 1, 3, 5. Okay, and then looking at the blue, it looks like it's decreasing between negative 5 and negative 3, and also from 5 to infinity. I'm not going to write less than infinity. I'll just write x is greater than 5. So any values of x larger than <coughs> 5, the graph is falling. So you can write your answer like negative 5, negative 3, and 5 infinity, if you wish. And then the last one, the constant, uh, we'll use black. So that's just between negative 1 and 3, negative 1 and 3. Okay. Um, quick comment on this. There is one point 
that is an endpoint that might be interesting. See this first point right here? It looks to me like the graph right here at this point is going down. You know what I'm saying? Like there's nothing on the left of it. I'm thinking if I can decide what to do at this point itself, I might decide that that also counts as a downhill. So if this is a roller coaster, that's sort of where you got on the train beginning of the roller coaster, and the train is already like this when you climbed into it. So you can fall out before you can come something. So the train is like literally resting like this when the person says all aboard. Okay, so that point might be a decreasing, but you guys are welcome to just leave all these open. But what I'm saying is some people might be strict and say, well, the graph is technically pointing down right there. Okay? All right, let's go on to the next page. Graphing a piecewise function. I suggest you graph the parabola first. Okay, you guys are you guys are good at that. This is a parabola shifted which way? Down, down, down to two. Shifted down two, right? So let's just draw a parabola shifted down two, and then we'll decide how much of it we want to keep. So remember how you draw a parabola. You start at the vertex, and you go right one up one, right two up four, right three up nine. Like this. Some of you have no strategy when you're graphing a parabola. So you're just kind of freehanding and it's not working out too good. So right one, up one, right two, up four, right three, up nine, right ten, up hundred. Y equals x squared. Right? Okay, so there's your graph. We don't really want all of it though. We really only want the part between negative one and two. So now let's do some surgery on this thing. Let's get rid of all that and all that. And there's your graph. And actually, we're not even going to keep the point at 2. It's open. So we're just going to keep it open. But it's still, its limit is 2. The left limit is 2. So there's your piece. Some of you did not draw the white hole high enough. You had it like this. So I took off points. Okay? So it needs to look like my blue. Right two, up four from the vertex. Okay, and then they have these other two lines. There's a 3x plus 2 line, which looks like this. This is the y equals 3x plus 2, but we don't want all of it. We only want the part that's less than negative 1. So find x equals negative 1 and destroy everything else. So we only want this part of it. And this is actually a real nice fit. The, the red line connects to the closed point on the blue parabola. Real nice fit there. Nice, con nice continuous point there. And then we have the 1 half x plus 4 line. That has a y-intercept 4, has slope half. But we don't want all of it. We only want the part where x is greater than or equal to 2. So we're going to get rid of all this. And there you have it. OK, so now you guys actually know a little more about this kind of topic. So I'm going to ask you like, questions like, what's the limit? as x comes to 2 from the left. By the way, what is the, x, what is the limit as x goes to 2 from the left? Look at the blue piece. What's the limit as x comes to 2 from the left? My finger is rising towards y goes to 2. What's the limit from the right? Now I've got to come from the right towards x equals 2. My destination appears to be y is equal to 5. And when we have differing limits, <coughs> we say that the limit not to what does not exist, right? Okay. Also, um, can you find the two spots, or can you find this, the one spot on this graph where it is not continuous? Where is it not continuous? At two, right? Because you have to lift your pen. 
Where is it not differentiable? Yeah, that just means not smooth, like not jagged. See that sharp corner right there? That's not differentiable. Also, it's not differentiable here either. You can't say it's a smooth ride on a roller coaster through that point. So basically, we have some calculus ideas there. When you guys answer these questions in number 10, I suggest you not use the graph because you drew it, and who knows how trustworthy it is, right? I suggest you use the given function, which is perfectly trustworthy. See? Except maybe when you do the range. Okay? All right, so let's just run through this. Um, some of you, I asked you to find f of negative 2, and you plug negative 2 into all three of these, and you give me three answers. There's a problem with that. A function can only have how many answers? One output, okay, by definition. So you cannot plug negative 2 into all three of these. You've got to pick one. <coughs> So which of these three creatures is hungry enough to eat the negative two? Only the first one, right. The first one's the only one that allows negative two. So you would do three times negative two plus two. That's, uh, the answer to that is negative four. Same thing with one. Plug it in, but choose carefully. You can't plug it into all three. You can only plug it into the one that will accept it. So one is in this domain, so you have to plug it into this one. And 20, 20, well, 20 is, let's see, is that uh, less than negative 1? Is that between negative 1 and 2, or is that greater than 2? It's greater than or equal to 2. Right, so we're going to plug in the 20 into that third one. We don't have a choice. This gives us 14. So what I'm saying is you don't need the picture. So we were frustrated. Why are you asking for f of 20? It's not even in my graph paper. It doesn't matter. You have the function. Okay, what is the range? So for this, I kind of regret scribbling out my graph. Remember the graph looked like this, roughly. So what I do for range is I take my pencil, okay, and I slide it up and down on the paper. So I'll do this. I'll actually start at the bottom and start sliding up. So I'll ask, when do I lose contact with the graph? Let's see. I've got contact with the graph. then I just declare where I had contact. So the answer is basically, I had contact, be, uh, basically, for all values of y less than 2, I had contact. See? And for all values of y greater than or equal to 5, I had contact. And that's how I do my range. And then for domain, I run my pencil this way. Okay, here's your pencil. Slide it across the paper. So basically, it's like drawing vertical lines. When do I lose contact with the graph? Never. Never lose contact with the graph. All reals. OK? And be prepared for multiple representations. So make sure you're ready for that interval notation. OK? So you can write this as negative infinity 2, 5 to infinity. And be ready to write this as negative infinity, negative infinity negative infinity, positive infinity. Okay? So you have two ways of writing your answers. Okay, so that's piecewise functions. And let's go to this one. So find GOG. I suggest before you find GOG, since G is going to get plugged into G, you've got to make sure G exists. So can you tell me just right up front a value of X that's forbidden? Zero, right. So I'm going to record that now. X cannot be zero. I'm going to get that out of the way. Now I'm going to go ahead and do a composition. So GOG means to do what? Plug G into G. G, right. 
So you're going to take this whole function and replace each x with it. So it's going to look like this. x plus 2 over x plus 2 over x plus 2 over x. <coughs> this used to say x plus 2 over x, but now it says x plus 2 over x plus 2 all over x plus 2 over x. All right, so that's very interesting. Composing a function with itself. How do we clean it up so we can process it better? I suggest we do what we did on the difference quotient problem earlier. Let's just multiply by x here and here. Okay, so multiplying the x by the first term I just circled gives me x plus 2. And multiplying by the second term, I get 2x. And on the bottom, you'll notice the x just cancels, and you just get x plus 2. So the answer is 3x plus 2 over x plus 2. Many of you got this wrong because you were care careless during the combining phase. Okay? You're supposed to be in reduced form, so that's as far as we can go. And then the last thing is I notice one more restriction now. Look, there's an x that's forbidden, another x that's forbidden. What is it? Negative 2. Negative 2 is forbidden. I didn't realize it until now. So there's two restrictions. The first one is x cannot be 0 because then g wouldn't even exist. The second one is gog wouldn't exist if x was negative 2. So we have to make sure we declare both. All righty. Um, and then let's go on to this page. So this is actually a pretty easy problem. It's saying that the x-intercepts are plus and minus 2. That means if y equals 0, x is plus or minus 2. That's what it means. x-intercept means y is 0. So all you would do there is just make your y 0 and make your x's 2's or negative 2's. So you end up with this, 4 minus a over 2b plus or minus 2. I don't care if it's plus or minus 2 really. Look at this. Doesn't a have to be 4 in order for this to be true? Okay, and then the next one says f of 6 is undefined. So you would write 6 squared minus a over 2b minus 6 is undefined. Well, I think b has to be 3 then, because undefined means the bottom is 0. And so I don't really care about the numerator. Um, it's saying that this is undefined. That means 2b minus 6 is 0. b has to be 3. So now you have your a and your b. You now know your function. Let's rewrite our function f of x is officially x squared minus 4 over 6 minus x, now that we know a and b. And if you want to find the y-intercept, let x be 0. So you literally just get negative 4 sixths or negative 2 thirds. Okay, I will continue recording this for fourth period, and it will end up as a video so you can look it over. Tomorrow we'll go over chapters 6 and 5. I don't know that we need to go over chapter 7. It's pretty straightforward. We just took the chapter 4 test, and you haven't even done corrections on it yet. Make sure you do corrections. Let's get started. OK, so on this uh, number 13, imagine if you're a businessman or a businesswoman, and you wanted to, let's say you were able to produce, I don't know, 120 boxes of something. But you weren't sure how much you should charge. Okay, you're going to sell these on eBay. You're not sure. Should I charge $40 for each one? Or should I charge $15 for each one? Like, what's my best situation? So this, I don't know where it came from, but this little formula here might be, for your business, a good formula. So we're, what would you want to charge as a price? See? Well, if you know that you've made 120 boxes, you can plug that into this price function, and it will tell you what to charge people. So what do you want to charge for the price of a box? Well, let's plug in 120, like that. And this gives you basically negative 24 plus 60. So it looks like you need to charge $36 per box according to this price function. How accurate is this? I don't know. I just made up the function. 
I literally just made it up. For each business, it's different. Okay? I just picked one similar to the book. Okay, now the next one says, find the cost function that represents the cost as a function of price P. Notice the first thing you'll need to do is isolate X in the first equation. So I actually gave away a lot of the problem here. Here's what it's supposed to be. I wanted you basically to write me a function that looks like this, but instead of having X's in it, it has P in it. Okay? I wanted P to be the independent variable. So... To do that, you need to know what P is. So if you start back at this beginning here, you know that P is negative one-fifth X plus 60, but you can always isolate X if you want. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to subtract 60 from both sides and then multiply by negative 5. This tells us that X is 300 minus 5P. Okay, so what is the purpose of this equation? Well, let's just review this problem. So what's going on? So you just opened a business. Maybe you want to sell some things on Amazon or eBay, right? You know you're only going to be able to produce X number of boxes. So you want to know how much to charge people. Well, you can certainly find how much to charge people by plugging in your X into this. Then you'll know how much to charge people. Okay? This is the cost of making the boxes. Okay? So... If you know how many boxes you have or plan to make, this will tell you how much it costs for you to make them. See? If you know the number of boxes. What is the purpose of this function? Does it calculate the price you'll charge people? Or does it calculate the cost to make a box? To put together one box. Which is it? Cost to make, cost to make. The output is that of cost. Right? But the input is what? Price. So this is the price if you know the number of boxes. This is the cost if you know the number of boxes. And this is the cost if you know the number, uh, if you know the uh, price per box. So if you're a business person, you might want to have all three of these handy so you can always whip out the one you need at the moment. You can also isolate P if you wish. And then you would have the price when you input the cost. So that's just, you know, further algebra. Let's go to um, the next question. Right here. Some of you did really well on this. Others not so well, but I'm sure you can all learn this. Um, the first thing I want to do is just look at what's being asked. Okay, so in this problem, it's asking me for the area of a circle. Well, I know the area of a circle. It's pi r squared. The problem is, it asks me to have x in my answer. It says in terms of x. Okay, so I might need to go back and reread the question in a minute, right? This next one is saying, find the area of the box, the area of the square. Well, that's simple enough. Area of any square is just the side length times the side length, right? In other words, it's just the side squared. So I got this far. But I need x in my answers. So now let me go back and reread the question. It says here that, we all, that this all started with a long piece of wire that was 10 meters long. And then it was split into two pieces, one whose length is x, and of course the other piece, which is the rest of the string. So what is the rest of the string if it's 10 meters long and you've used up x of it? How much is left? 10 minus x remains. OK, so here's the logic jump. When we made the circle, we made it using the piece of length x. So this distance from here going around, okay, this distance is x. But what do you call the distance around a circle? Circumference. And what's the formula for circumference? 2 pi r. So we're saying that 2 pi r is x. See? 2 pi r is x. I was hoping to get r for my little area formula. So what am I going to put in here for r? I'm going to have to figure out what r is. Let's go back to this block equation and isolate r. So what's r? How do you get r by itself? Divide by 2 pi, right? So you're going to stick in 2 pi right there. That's the answer. That's all I wanted. 
So it's pi r squared with an x look to it. Okay? Same thing with the next one. This piece of string, this second piece of string, had length 10 minus x. See? But I made a four-sided shape with it. So what is the length of each side? The total perimeter is 10 minus x. But how long is one side? One fourth of that, right. So the side length here is 10 minus x over 4. The side length here is 10 minus x over 4. The side length here is 10 minus x over 4. The side length here is 10 minus x over 4. How do I find the area of a square? You just square one side, right? So the area will be the side length squared, in other words, 10 minus x over 4 squared. So this happens in calculus all the time. You'll be given a situation where you're just finding area of a circle or area of a square. That's not hard. It's understanding that it's not in terms of radius. So this would be called area in terms of circumference. And this would be called area in terms of perimeter and so forth. To be comfortable with having a different input. So x is the input instead of r side length. OK, so that's the last problem of this test. And that means that um, I can clear the screen and stop the video. But if you need to see...